not, I'll turn it over to Bree, who will introduce today's speaker. It's a real pleasure to introduce Max, who's currently a postdoc in my lab. He did his undergrad at UC Davis and then completed his PhD at Yale. Um, Max is a great resource for the community. He's been around for the year, so many of you may have met him. But it's always nice when new people join for grad students and postdocs to know kind of what they excel at so that you can go tap them for ways that they might be fun to interact with. So I'll give you a few fun facts about Max so that you know what some of his expertise are. Before I do that, I will also highlight the fact that he has an incredible research and science communication um, background. and. I won't tell that as fun facts, but he finished his PhD with 20 papers. You don't need to do that as a PhD <laughs> student in order to be successful. But when you have someone that's had that level of productivity during their PhD, it's kind of nice to tap them to find out what some of their tips and tricks were to make sure that things were moving forward. And he also has been able to communicate a lot of that scientific information very broadly and has a huge Twitter following. And just gave me a Twitter lesson on Monday, which was awesome. <laughs> Okay, fun facts. Max, I'm going to read these because they were so great. Max has successfully resuscitated every turtle he's given CPR to. <laughs> In Max's spare time, he loves lifting and tumbling, and so apparently while at Yale, he was constantly being recruited by the cheerleading team, and they were unsuccessful, but I feel like Berkeley has a little step up on Yale in some ways, and maybe we could have a, yeah, a future for Max in cheerleading. And then um, Max was also very active in the Peabody Museum at Yale. He worked there as a curatorial assistant his entire time in graduate school and was kind of the go-to person for really large and difficult preparations. And so during his time, he prepped wolves, bobcats, a bunch of crocodiles, and a 12-foot dolphin. And you can ask him how you prep 12-foot animals in your free time. Awesome. Glad to have Max here and hope you enjoy the talk. Thanks, Rachel. And thank you all for coming today. Actually, it was an undergrad with Brad Schaefer's lab, and Brad spent his entire time mentoring me, talking about how great the MVC was. It's been a lot of fun to be here the past few months, uh, interacting with many of you. Uh, a little context about who I am. Uh, my research interests generally fall into kind of four broad categories. A lot oh, of folks. I'm going to interrupt you. And he's starting a Smith postdoc fellowship in the fall, which links conservation work directly to. Yeah. Still my okay. feather. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so broadly, I fall under these four kind of categories. So some folks like to classify me generally as an urban ecologist. I really understanding how species uh, interact with and are impacted by urban systems, whether in cities or their suburbs. Um, a lot of other folks will classify me as someone who uh, studies sex, whether these be sex differences, the evolution of sex determination, um, sex reversal, these kind of things that I'm broadly interested in. Um, and today I'm jazzed to talk to you a little bit about uh, a chunk of my PhD and master's work that falls somewhere in the center of these different interests, um, and which was really kind of an idea born out of a, a topic in environmental science that has since shed some interesting light on the biology of amphibians, I think. Um, before going too far, I'll leave just a few definitions that I'm going to use here. Um, the idea of phenotypic sex is, for the sake of frogs at least, having either testes, you're a male, ovaries, you're a female. Your genotypic sex is a predisposition towards developing either testes or ovaries. Um, today's talks to folks a lot on sex reversal, where an individual's phenotypic sex develops opposite its genotypic sex. And I'll be using the word intersex a lot here, which refers to when uh, adult male frogs have this uh, condition in their testes where they have oocytes or egg-like cells, that's what we kind of see here <coughs> histologically. Um, I'm going to think of things out of Project Biodiversified's book and say that these are really useful terms for talking about amphibians and frogs, but we shouldn't abstract these terms and concepts beyond that towards human sex, gender, sexuality, um, orientation. So this is the talk about frogs and amphibians. All right, so the main theme of today is how does the tadpole develop into either a phenotypic male or a phenotypic female from embryo uh, to metamorphosis and then to adulthood? Um, I'm going to be focusing today on this critter. This is the green frog, Ranaclamptans. If you've ever been anywhere in eastern or central North America and you stumble across one frog, it's probably this frog. They're pretty <coughs> widespread, they're pretty abundant, and they're very useful for studying the effects of land use because they can pretty much live in anything, from the middle of nowhere in these kind of pristine forested areas in New England uh, to the middle of these kind of gross, scrubby sort of uh, backyard ponds and suburbs and cities. Um, as adults, they're highly sexually dimorphic. These males have bright yellow throats, <coughs> very large tympana to help them bellow for their mating calls. Uh, 
Whereas females are a little more cryptic, they're darker color, they're very hard to see behaviorally. Um, this is a very nice little species to work with. So if, as far as sex determination is concerned, there's two general <coughs> camps of what sex determination is. Uh, one aspect of this is genotypic sex determination, G GSD, which is what we have. So these are species that have genes on sex chromosomes that establish whether you'll become a phenotypic male or a phenotypic female. The other kind of branch of sex determination is environmental sex determination, so ESD. This is where environmental conditions experienced early on autonomy <coughs> set your path towards developing into one sex or another. Like so many binaries, it's kind of a, a false binary. In the past couple of decades, people have been reimagining this as more of a, a sex determination spectrum. So species occur along the spectrum bounded by strict GSD and strict ESD, and they have um, a, a genetic predisposition towards developing as male or female, but environmental effects, that's the BE there, can cause some individuals in a population or a cohort to sex reverse. So they actually develop their phenotypic sex opposite their genotypic sex. Across vertebrates, uh, there's actually a pretty substantial uh, patterning. Mammals and birds have uh, GSD, so these are the two left columns here are X, Y, and Z, W, genetic sex determining method or modes. Um, X, Y, and males have two different sex chromosomes. Z, W, females have two different sex chromosomes. Um, the mammals are pretty well fixed for an X, Y system, whereas birds are pretty much fixed for a Z, W system. The orange column there are species which have strict environmental sex determination. So these are things like many turtles, a lot of fishes do as well. And then the far column is the species which have genetic sex determination but environmental sex reversal. Um, it's pretty well known for a number of fish species and a number of uh, li lizards. Um, but for the sake of amphibians, for the most part, they're not <coughs> going to have really any obvious environmental effects naturally on their sex determination. But there are a number of species of amphibians which have either an XY or a ZW sex determining system. Now, I think this is kind of interesting to look at the biogenic <coughs> context, but our, I think it's going to take a historical look at how we kind of came to this conclusion. So back in the early 1900s, experimental biologists were bombarding tadpoles with all sorts of weird environmental conditions from acids to bases, uh, high temperatures and low temperatures, low carb diets and high carb diets, trying to see what influenced sexual development in these animals. And they recognized that chromosomes probably had a pretty big role to play in your phenotypic sex, but assumed that the environment also had a pretty large role. And that was kind of their conclusion. Um, so if you take Helen King's quote here, it probably throws her somewhere along this sex reversal spectrum rather than at either end, um, exclusively. By the middle of the 1900s, uh, biologists had been karyotyping and cytogenically looking at all bunch of, of vertebrate species. Um, whereas mammals and birds have very morphologically different and differentiated X and Y, or Z and W sex chromosomes. It's not really the case in a lot of fishes and amphibians. Their sex chromosomes, if they have them, look more or less the same. So it's kind of hard to tell apart an X and Y chromosome or a Z and W cytogenically. So Susumu Ono, who literally wrote the book on vertebrate sex chromosomes, kind of assumed amphibians are more or less towards that far end where they have environmental sex termination. This changed a bit again towards the end of the 1900s, where Berkeley's Raymond Tyrone Hayes wrote a pretty exquisite review of amphibian sexual differentiation and sex termination. Um, kind of looking back retrospectively over the past century of work, um, we had new experiments that were pretty, um, pretty well showing that all amphibians had some genetic basis of sex. And critiquing these older experiments on sex reversal, oftentimes the experiments were so abstract compared to natural conditions that it's kind of hard to tell how real that sex reversal was naturally, how well it reflected natural conditions. If you're boiling a tadpole at 35 to 40 degrees Celsius, <laughs> they're not going to experience that in the wild, so if there's sex reversing there, how real is that? So this is kind of the baseline we've been working on over the past 20 years, that amphibian genetic sex termination is explicitly genetic, exclusively genetic, um, and for the most part, things that sex reverse here along the spectrum are either a laboratory artifact or probably something to do with um, unnatural conditions. Uh, this kind of also has <coughs> grown the past 20, 30 years of a field of toxicology on endocrine disrupting chemicals. So as the name suggests, these are contaminants or pollutants uh, that we may experience every day, whether they be pharmaceuticals or pesticides, that interact with our hormone system. Um, for the most part, these are focused on reproductive hormones, things like estrogen and testosterone, <coughs> that can influence sexual development, reproductive function, and production of sperm, ovaries. Um, some of these, like pharmaceuticals, like oral contraceptives, we actively design these to be endocrine receptors to interfere with our normal ho hormone function. Some of them, like the herbicide atrazine, which I'm sure many people here are familiar with, um, are things that were not meant to be that way, but which have uh, impacts on uh, vertebrate sexual development. So, we know from a lot of experiments that there's a whole boatload of different kind of chemicals out in our world that we experience, that animals experience, 
that can influence them. Um, in some contexts, they can cause this intersex condition. So males will develop these egg-like cells in their testes. We call this intersex. Um, expanding that further, there's the idea that if males are developing ovarian-like traits in their testes, maybe some of them go a little step further and they fully sex reverse. So if they're sex reversing, maybe end up with these female bias sex ratios uh, because you have more females, uh, phenotypic females produced as genetic males have, have switched sex. Now this is only interesting to me uh, in a kind of broader evolutionary context uh, because genetic sex discrimination is a little diverse in amphibians. So this is kind of the most recent phylogenetic uh, analysis of amphibian genetic sex discrimination. Salamanders on top, frogs on the bottom. Uh, the red clades are those which have an XY sex determining system, so males have two different sex chromosomes. The blue colors here are taxa, which have a ZW sex chromosome system, so females have two different sex chromosomes. There's a few individuals here that have a, that are labeled green, orange, and yellow. There's a little wonky, but there's still genetic sex determination um, there. Uh, ben Evans and colleagues basically concluded that there have been at least 32 transitions in the heterogametic sex across the amphibian phylogeny. It's a lot of switches <coughs> in which sex is heterogametic. Um, but this is probably still a pretty conservative estimate given that we know so the genetic sex term mode of any of most amphibians. Um, and some of these are a little conservative here. So this yellow taxon right here is a Japanese wrinkled frog. It's labeled as one transition state, but the species is weird. On the islands of Japan, it has an XY system uh, in the west, but it's independently uh, evolved at a ZW system in different parts of the island, reconversion XY, and they all hybridize along those different areas. So it's a totally bonkers <laughs> system going on here. And since the study, we have new species from the Brazilian Amazon that have six pairs of X and Y chromosomes, which is more sex chromosomes than it has autosomes. Um, so things are really weird in that area. But what's interesting about this is how do you get a pattern like this to form across evolutionary time? Well. Almost every single model of sex determining mode transitions invokes uh, either environmental sex reversal or the evolution of environmental sex determination to be able to go across different types of sex determining modes. Um, which puts us in a kind of a weird conundrum uh, because people who study fish and lizards pretty well accept this, and we actually have good evidence now uh, from bearded dragons that they soon switch from different forms of GSD, genetic sex determination, and environmental sex determination uh, through a sex reversal pathway. We're getting into a weird conundrum. Is sex reversal even happening in wild populations of amphibians? And then if so, to what, de to what degree is that a toxicological effect, a natural effect, or some combination of the two um, in the wild? This is actually really hard to study because for the most part, it's hard to genetically sex amphibians when the sex chromosomes look more or less the same. So naturally that brings us to the kind of kiss <laughs> where so many great stories happen. Um, these are two of my study sites, many. These are kind of a, a classic Connecticut or Southern New England habitat. These ponds are natural ponds. They've been modified, so they're dug out to be deeper. They're broadened quite a bit, so they hold water longer than they would naturally. Um, these are kind of landscape images, these same two ponds in the center there. Surrounded by different degrees of um, uh, housing density, lots of roads, lots of lawns. Uh, some of these, like this one here, has a septic system, which is kind of right about there. So within 30 meters of the pond edge. Um, this one here is on sanitary sewer. So the sewer is about 20 meters away from that pond. Heavily impacted sites, totally weird sites, but they still host a diversity of amphibians, turtles, birds, mammals. They're kind of fun little places to work and interact with uh, your community. Now, when I started, I left Davis and went to Yale to start my master's and then do my PhD. There's some emerging work from our lab, uh, mostly done by undergraduates, showing uh, collecting green frogs, adult male green frogs from backyard ponds and finding intersex kind of everywhere. Any backyard you hop into, you grab a frog, and the chance was it probably had intersex uh, condition. And it's kind of surprising, not even name it, surprising, but just interesting, <coughs> for the most part, uh, most of the work on amphibian uh, sexual development is focused on agricultural context for, for years now. So it's kind of brought a new sort of landscape context of where this intersex is happening. So when I first came, I was really curious what chemical effects might even be happening in the suburbs. Uh, there's no massive amounts of pesticides being sprayed, they're not being sprayed regularly. Maybe someone's <laughs> spot spraying their back here, but not any sort of massive context. Um, are we getting chemicals from people's septic systems, their sewer lines, something else weird they're putting on lawns, road runoff, runoff over buildings? Um, that's one of the questions I was hoping to address. And then if we extend this further from intersex, do we see kind of sex ratio shifts concurrent with changing chemical landscape in the suburbs? So for the chemical part of that, we actually managed to team up with a really great colleague, Larry Barber at the USGS, who's a pretty uh, phenomenal um, chemist. Uh, 
and we use gas chromatography tandem S, but to assay kind of a whole slew of different chemicals that we possibly might expect to find in people's backyards, either natural hormones that you and I are making now, things like pharmaceuticals, pesticides, kind of trying to target what all the variable sources that might be coming into these backyard ponds would be. And of course, comparing these to a handful of different uh, forested ponds that had no obvious sign of human influence on them, no suburban development, no urban development, no ag, uh, kind of as rural and undeveloped as you can possibly get in Connecticut. So here's a little bit of data. I'm not going to go too much into the chemistry of this, but here's the general conclusion. The y-axis here is the number of endocrine disrupting chemicals, so the diversity of uh, contaminants found in the ponds. The x-axis breaks it down by whether it's one of four forested ponds with no obvious land use, or suburban ponds that either have septic systems or sanitary sewers getting rid of the waste from the household. Uh, all the forested ponds except one are pretty much absent for any sort of chemical. We assay for several dozen different contaminants. We have one force upon with one chemical, that's estrone, and we're all making that right now. So that could be a contaminant or that could be some deer did its business right before we sampled uh, near a pond, which is possible. Um, the other two things, so these two suburban land types, whether they're separate or sewer, didn't have any difference. But on average, any suburban pond you go to has two to three different types of endocrine receptors in it. Um, and so the grotius ponds, they have up to six or seven different kinds of chemicals. Um, and this comes from a whole variety of sources. I'm just going to tell you about two quickly. Um, one I call your toilet estrogen, so these are things you're flushing down your drain. This could be, you know, things in your shampoo, your pharmaceuticals, whatever, making their way through septic systems and sewer lines through groundwater and into ponds. And we actually know this is going through groundwater. We popped 10 foot groundwater wells in these, uh, in the ground between the pond and the household and are finding the same chemicals in the pond also in the groundwater. And we're also finding a lot of what are called phytoestrogens, which literally means plant-based <coughs> estrogens. These are compounds that are similar to estrogens made by plants for a completely different function than interfering with vertebrate sexual development. But we found uh, multiple types of phytoestrogens in each urban pond that are completely absent in the middle of forest areas. Um, and agricultural people have known about these for decades for interfering with sheep reproduction. Um, so we think things like clover and other ornamental plants that we choose to put in our backyards that don't exist normally in the middle of forests are probably <coughs> contributing these into the soil and pushing their way down these ponds. And, Clover is one of these plants that's really well known to produce these chemicals and it grows right along the pond edge. It loves very moist soil, so it's a, a likely culprit. So we know that the chemical landscape of forests and suburban environments is completely different. Uh, we have a lot of chemicals we have in suburban ponds that don't exist in forested ponds. Does that mean a con concomitant shift in sex ratios? So we also sample from the same set of ponds, little metamorphosing green frogs, so tadpoles grow on four legs, losing that tail, uh, as they were to leave the pond. Um, to understand whether cohort sex ratios are varying along a similar gradient of suburban land use. So this x-axis here is the percent of suburban land cover on the pond. So if you look at these aerial images, it's a portion of land cover that's either entirely forested or 0% <coughs> suburban, or the far right end, a, a landscape that's comprised of boatloads of houses, lawns, and <coughs> roads. It's kind of a catch-all proxy for the impact of human landscape development on a given water body. The y-axis here is our sex ratio, uh, displayed as percent female. So this is um, the percent of a cohort of different metamorphosed <coughs> green frogs that is comprised of female and females. So a couple of fun things to take away from this figure. As ponds become increasingly surrounded by suburban land use by more and more households within that kind of a buffer around the pond, we end up with a higher portion of female going forward. And that's kind of what we expect given that contamination profile I just showed you. So we had a super interesting pattern, but one that's interesting because for the most part, uh, we, no one's really explored patterns of sex ratio variation across uh, environmental gradients and wild populations of amphibians. So that was fun. The other interesting part about this figure, these are our four forest ponds, no obvious signs of contamination. These sex ratios are all below this 50% mark. They're all male biased. <coughs> that's weird, I just told you that all amphibians have genetic sex determination and they should all have equal sex ratios. And now all of our natural ponds that we expect to be 50-50 are all male biased. So what's going on? So it starts to challenge a little bit maybe where amphibians fall along the sex determination spectrum. Do they strictly have genetic sex determination? Is that sex ratio pattern I showed you even the result of sex reversal? Um, and if sex reversal is happening, what degree is there a natural or anthropogenic origin to these sort of um, patterns? So that's why I spent kind of the last couple of years of my PhD kind of plugging away at parts of this. Um, to be able to understand whether <coughs> sex reversal is actually happening, to understand whether an individual has developed a phenotypic sex opposite to genetic sex, 
you have to know it's genetic sex. And that's been really hard to do in amphibians for a long time. And we're lucky we're in the age of genomics now where we can actually try and uh, take a blunt force attempt at this. So I'm not going to go into the details of what we did, but for those of you who are familiar with uh, DD rat seek methods like that, we kind of explored the green frog genome and managed to find a handful of sex linked loci that are specific to males and not females that allow us to go back now and retroactively uh, genotype the sex of any embryo, tadpole, or, or green frog <coughs> in southern New England. So this is a very useful tool. Um, and we can go back out now to the same population and more populations and genotype them. <coughs> so I went out and looked at the same four set of forested ponds that we know had little contamination. Another dozen suburban ponds along kind of a, a spectrum of suburban land use. Genotyped the sex of all adult and metamorph frogs we pulled out there. So over 450 adults across these 16 ponds and over 200 metamorph posing tadpoles. Um, we have fewer metamorphs. So a lot of these ponds are drying in a drought, so some of the ponds dried before the tadpoles uh, made it out, which is unfortunate. Um, we're able to use a really neat new Bayesian modeling approach where we can actually uh, probabilistically assign each uh, frog's genotype based on its uh, genotype across multiple loci and then understand kind of the most probable environmental correlates of sex reversal, both female to male reversal and uh, male to female sex reversal. So I'm going to show you some fun data that's now in press. It'll be out hopefully in a couple of weeks. Um, I think it's kind of fun. So this is a nice little summary of sex reversal frequencies in green frogs. So here on the y-axis are 16 different ponds. This is the pond names that don't really matter for the sake of uh, right now. The x-axis is the percent of each sample in each population that is comprised of sex reverse individuals. So these black bars are XX males. So these are animals being referred to be genetic females that have sex reverse into phenotypic males. The red bars are the opposite. These are animals that we've referred to be genetic males that have sex reverse into phenotypic females based off the genotype and gonad of these animals. Um, there's kind of a couple of interesting things to take away from this. 12 of 16 populations have some degree of sex reversal. Sex reversal is kind of happening everywhere you kind of look for for the most part. Um, and we have both directions showing up, which is pretty interesting, because in general, people who have looked at fishes or uh, lizards tend to target one form of sex reversal. So we see both males turning into females and females turning into males. What's also interesting about that is these three ponds here have both forms of sex reversal present in the adult population, which is pretty fascinating that we have bidirectional sex reversal in a single environment. Now, this is a talk about suburbs and contamination. So you might wonder, are these four ponds at the bottom here that have no type of sex reversal? the four forested ponds that we think they might be? Makes me know. So these are four uncannated forested ponds, <coughs> which is called the general trend of everything else. So you have two forested ponds which have female to male reversal, one that has female to male reversal, and one type forested pond that has, again, bidirectional sex reversal. So this is starting to make us wonder whether human language is even causing the sex reversal to happen in parts of the United And just to kind of show us another way, uh, these are kind of bivariate plots. The x-axis here again is our percent suburban. This left panel here is the it's a, it's a binomial relationships. The probability that a genetic female has sex reversed into a phenotypic male. The right plot is the probability that a genetic male has sex reversed into a phenotypic female. Um, and the adults again. And these are statistically flat lines. There's really no influence of suburban land use and those associated contaminants in increasing the frequency of sex reversal. So not just the presence or absence of sex reversal, but the frequency. Whoever's causing sex reversal to occur in these adult populations seems pretty independent so far um, of people's backyards. Uh, we can layer on top of that then that intersex conditions. This is the right panel here, the great bars against sex reversal. Um, I'm not going to dig into intersex, but for the most part, while my uh, advisor and other people in the lab have found intersex pretty common in the suburbs, I also found that, but I also found it pretty common in the middle of forest too. So any forest of bond we went to, we found the intersex males too, despite not really finding any contamination there. Um, and there's really no associations between whether a pond had more form of sex reversal or other and having more intersex. So it seems like whatever's causing intersex and what's causing sex reversal also seem independent environmental correlations. And the trouble with adults is that this species lives to be seven or eight years old, takes three to four years to mature. So if you sample adults, you're sampling multiple overlapping cohorts of uh, individuals. Um, which makes it hard to identify any particular causal environmental uh, factor that might be driving sex reversal. So you really want to know whether sex reversal is metamorphosing tadpoles associated with temperature, whether it's pollution, whether it's natural pond chemistry, whether it's land use. Um, so it's really the power of this kind of Bayesian modeling approach we took. We measured a bunch of um, 
different environmental variables to see kind of what second was the best probabilistic um, explanatory variable. Um, and as you might expect, it's probably not land use. And actually one variable kind of kept popping up as the most uh, significant and important factor for both male and female and female and male reversal. And that was temperature. So here in this panel again, the probability that a genetic female has sex averse into a phenotypic male. This x-axis is the average pond temperature that tadpoles experience in natural ponds, wild ponds. That's whether you control for land use and contamination or not. So these are things that are in happening independent of us. So what does this show is that at cooler pond temperatures, in our animals that are growing up in cooler ponds, a genetic female has a high probability of sex averse into a male, and that probability declines in ponds that are, are warmer. Until metamorphosis. You get a different pattern with female or male to female reversal. As ponds become increasingly warm, there's a high probability that genetic, female, genetic males will sex averse into phenotypic females. This is interesting because this shows bidirectional temperature induced sex reversal. And then again, this is not environmental sex reversal or sex determination. This is not temperature dependent sex determination. This is temperature sex reversal. And these aren't laboratory experiments, these are wild populations. This is pretty fascinating, sort of new data, uh, and they're hoping to get out soon. And the very bidirectional aspect of this too is particularly fascinating. Um, I'm going to build off this and I'm not going to wax poetic for too long. For those of you who came to my herb group talk, I kind of proposed this hypothesis that maybe sex reversal of fishes and amphibians and reptiles may be an adaptive trait sometimes. Uh, the idea of this is building off of deep evolutionary theory, trying to explain environmental sex determination. The idea being maybe one phenotypic sex uh, develops better in a particular environmental condition than the other. And so it behooves you to try and develop as that phenotypic sex. In the case of green frogs here, have a, a hypothetical temperature versus relative fitness plot. Um, perhaps the cooler temperatures, phenotypic males develop better than phenotypic females. And so if you're a genetic female, you're going to go towards it being a phenotypic female too. Maybe it behooves you to actually switch your sex and develop as a phenotypic male. The opposite might be happening in warmer temperatures, where it may be more advantageous to be um, a phenotypic female. Now, this is like hypothetical, and we don't have any more evidence that I just showed you, um, but it's tantalizing and probably worth exploring whether there is an adaptive effect of um, thermal section or something. So, I gave this whole sex ratio plot that was kind of the motivation behind even trying to look into sex reversal in these critters. And I also just showed you that even despite there being uh, no or a great pattern of sex ratios and, and suburbanization, there's no real relationship between sex reversal and suburbanization. So what degree is sex reversal even explain this uh, nonsense here? And for time, if we're getting tight, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. Our show data, when we have the phenotypic sex ratio bias at metamorphosis, for ever now, we thought that this is a consequence of something happening um, from fertilization to metamorphosis to tadpoles, which is a pretty reasonable assumption. Um, for the most part, over the past over a century now, we thought this is probably sex reversal. So when you have a phenotypic sex ratio bias, probably because the animal is sex reversing and driving that phenotypic sex ratio to be skewed one way or another. That's one hypothesis, but there's another completely reasonable one. Maybe one genetic sex just sucks in a particular environment and dies more than the others. So we have sex bias mortality. We don't have any good evidence of sex bias mortality really in any fish, amphibian, or reptile, but it's a completely reasonable hypothesis. Um, it's per probably unexplored. We also have sex averse individuals and we have sex averse adults. Do those adults breed? That's something we don't actually know. Are they functionally sex averse animals? If so, that kind of complicates the genetic constituency of the sex ratio at fertilization. In an XX, XY sex chromosome uh, species, if you're genetically female, you're a person definitively male, you still have two X chromosomes. All the sperm you could possibly make are X bearing, which means if you breed with a non sex averse female, your entire clutch is going to be genetically female. If you're a genetic male that's reversed into a phenotypic female, you're going to end up making male bias clutches genetically. So if you assume if you aggregate across all, all these different clutches from all the different breeding attempts, you may have an entire cohort that's genetically sex ratio skewed. So, I don't watch that data because it's kind of a mess to show uh, graphically. I went out and actually monitored two populations of green frogs from fertilization through metamorphosis, sampling hundreds of embryos from dozens of clutches for each population. And then going back and repeatedly sampling these tadpole sex ratios as they progress in metamorphosis. And again, sampling metamorphs, genotyping in uh, many thousands of these animals. Um, looking at the gonadal sex of these metamorphs, <coughs> trying to figure out do we have skewed sex ratios at the, uh, in clutches showing that adults breeding? Do we have sex bias mortality? Do we see changes in the genetic sex ratio across time suggesting that one 
sex with dime more than the other? And then do we have sex reversal contributing to that final phenotypic sex ratio? The answer is all of these are happening. So in any given population, you have a skewed <laughs> genetic sex ratio right up front, suggesting that more or less actually in the, in the situation that genetic females that are um, reversing to males are breeding more often than the other way around, but both are still breeding. We have sex bias mortality in both <coughs> the population genetic males die more often than genetic females did. And we also had pretty high rates of uh, female or male to female reversal, some female to male reversal. So that that final genetics or phenotypic sex ratio you have at metamorphosis is the byproduct of multiple independent things happen at the same time, sex reversal both directly and indirectly, as well as sex bias mortality. This is a very complicated part of the case. <laughs> um, one thing that I kind of like talking about too is the kind of fun part about seeing breeding animals like this that are sex reversed is that it kind of more or less can break the idea of a binary sex in, in these animals. We more or less have four functional sexes happen. You get animals that are genetically female and phenotypically female, but also phenotypically male. The same is true with genetic males. And they're all breeding, they're all contributing to the next generation. So we have kind of a fascinating new system to play with we're looking at the sexual diversity of amphibians. And I don't think we've actually explored this um, as far as we can. So I'm looking forward to kind of playing with that going forward. So I'll give a quick summary and then I'll let you guys ask me things. Um, I started off telling you that we're, you know, best of our knowledge, and all amphibians have genetic sex discrimination. And that is the best of our knowledge, but we can start pushing some species further along this gradient to having a natural for sex reversal. Um, the degree to which that sex reversal might explain sex ratio variation in the wild populations is more complex than just a one to one relationship. And that's kind of an interesting phenomenon for us, for those of us who are looking at population dynamics of amphibians over time. No one's really looking at the different processes that have to be controlling sex ratios, even whether it be metamorphs or adults. Um, I think I provide some tantalizing evidence that maybe there's some adaptive potential for sex reversal. I, I think it's worth looking at in the world this may actually play in having all those transitions among different genetic sex determining modes and amphibians. And I think whether it's unfortunate or fortunate, I don't know, um, the relative role that anthropogenic conditions play relative to natural ones and causing <coughs> Intersex or sex reversal or sex ratio variation in wild populations may be more muddy than it was when I started my PhD, um, which is a frustrating way to write a dissertation. Um, but I think there's like a lot of interesting things we can start playing with now to understand what natural variables are really influencing the animals and the extent to which we are aggravating that more than before. Um, I'm going to put a quick plug in. If you guys are going to the evolution meeting, uh, Rob Vince and I are hosting a sponsor symposium on vertebrate sex determination and sex reversal. We have a pretty sizable lineup of uh, really cool people to talk with. So if you're interested in fishes, amphibians, or reptiles, this should be a fun symposium for a day. Um, and with that, I'll thank all the people who helped and all of you and if any questions. Uh, <clears throat> among the environmental potential environmental influences that you looked at, did you mention population density? Have you, have you looked at that at all as a possible environmental uh, force of some sort? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, for the most part, we actually have data on these suburban and forested ponds. Um, in general, suburban ponds have a higher larval and adult density than these forested ponds. Um, in part, we think it's because uh, these are tend, tend to be a little warmer on average, not always. Um, it kind of depends on pond depth. Um, we did actually model that. I can go back and try and play with that. I wouldn't imagine there would be any obvious effect. There is, um, in fishes, the idea of what's called sequential hermaphrodism. So adults can actually switch sex um, in, in biased adult sex ratios. Not really great evidence for that, for sequential um, hermaphrodism in amphibians. There's a couple of anecdotes, but I guess it's possible we can look into that a little more. And maybe the tadpole stage, too. Should be naive with me, but. Could the skewing of the gen, the you know genetics or the you know, phenotypic sex ratio, also be due to predation of the males, since they tend to advertise where they are to predators when they're calling? So the phenotypic sex ratio was that metamorphosis. So there's no external differences at that point in time between males and females. These are you can't tell a sex apart by <coughs> anything if that should open up and look at the gonads. So at that point in time when they're leaving the pond, probably not. There could be, we have some evidence from um, some lab work we've been doing that male and female tadpoles actually do different things as a tadpole stage. Um, mm -hmm. Males tend to be a lot more active and females tend to eat a lot more and just that kind of state put. So it's possible there's sex bias predation happening in the tadpole stage, which could be getting at that sex bias mortality we also see. Mm -hmm. 
you know from uh, Tyrone Hayes' work that the sex reversed uh, Xenopus, at least, is capable of breeding. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have any indications here, though. That oh, yeah. The, yeah, so we, we have skewed, you know that? yes, we have skewed clutch sex ratios, uh, which is mm -hmm. indicative of breeding. Yeah. We don't have like laboratory evidence where we're actually tracking individual or breeding. Individual, right, individual. Yeah, so we haven't done like parentage analysis of some of these to see, mm -hmm. see who's actually breeding, but we can infer pretty well when you have an entire female clutch. There's one, only one really obvious way you get that. Yeah. So what happens to YY individuals in a male sex reverse to females? So they're probably dying. We actually didn't find a single YY individual. Um, and my guess that's because that's, that's common in fishes. In so that's stores. a pretty substantial genetic load on that sex, that individual type. <coughs> yeah. And so what maintains it, therefore? Well, they're producing thousands of embryos at one time. So I'm not sure if losing a, a quarter of your um, fertilization attempts matters. It may not even be affecting fertilization because those are wide-ranging sperms. They may not even penetrate the egg for all you know. I feel compelled to point out that uh, your tree did not include one order of embryos. <laughs> 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 which is not surprising, because we know the chromosome numbers and configurations for fewer than 10% of the known species. So my message is, get to work. <laughs> it could be fascinating. Oh, I think it would be. No, I mean, and even, even the salamanders are way underrepresented compared to frogs. So we we know 90 species of genetic sex from bone. There are almost 8,000, and I don't know. It's all a mess. <laughs> so, do you have any ideas for testing the adaptive sex reversal hypothesis that you proposed? Yeah, about doing that? Yeah, I like think when doing green frog species of pain to work with it takes over a year to metamorphose and it's not gonna mature for three or four years. I think it'd be fun to start playing with things like Nisudacris around here or something like that that can mature more quickly than you can breed in the lab and actually test whether those who are sex averse or not are like having higher fitness, whether they survive better, whether they develop better. Um, so I think you just, you can play with these thermal sex reversal experiments in the lab and you especially genotype each individual you know the genetic sex too. The follow-up? Yeah, so I think it, in your herp group, you talked about, um, we talked afterwards a little bit about the experiment that was done with, uh, with the yeah. Epibolaris or Tentacles or whatever it was yeah. in Australia. And I can't remember if you thought that that was a legit experiment or not, or if that's the sort of approach you think you would have taken. So there's, there's a reason why I expanded the idea of temperature dependent sex generation to sex reversal. So the paper that happened on Jackie Dragon in Australia, basically they were able to block um, normal sexual differentiation hormonally and cause um, one phenotype of sex to develop when it shouldn't based off the temperature regime is growing it. Um, I challenge whether that was actually temperature dependent sex termination because if you actually look at the thermal response of sex ratios across temperature gradients, you never have 50-50, or you, you have 50-50 quite often, which is indicative of sex reversal and not temperature dependent sex termination. So I actually think they started demonstrating for me that sex reversal is adaptive in that context. So that's Dan Ward and Rich, I had a great paper. Okay. So, um, first one is a comment. This is wild. It's so cool. Um, I'm just curious. What's the evidence that it would that, that having this temperature um, determination would be beneficial, or why would you propose you know females be better at a warmer temperature? It, that's kind of the funny part of the theory. It doesn't really get into why it might be particularly advantageous to one sex or another. The idea is that for whatever that species-specific biology is. Ovaries are better at warmer or cold temperatures, or tasty better at one versus the other, for whatever that context is. It could be non adaptive. It could, just it could be, be neutral for all we know, too, yeah. So um, it's been, there's a whole boat, boatloads of mathematical models on this, and there's only been one empirical test, the best of my knowledge, on it. Um, but it could be completely neutral. That's totally right. I was wondering what you knew about the mating system, because in some species you can have phenotypically female. Individuals that are being sort of a sneaker type, so sort of fish or lizard. Yeah, so Kent Mullis has some really cool work from the 60s, I think, on this species. And so they actually, fem females actually don't choose males, they choose egg deposition sites. So males every few days are actually switching their clump of grass they're trying to guard. Um, some males are very good at it, some males aren't, and they are called satellite males, but it's never actually clear if they are um, sneaking in an extra copulation somehow. Um, 
body size the best predictor, nothing more to do with color or tin ham size or something of that sort. Um, we have a couple weird genetic sex ratios that almost suggest that we actually have two males breeding with the same female. And we know with a couple of frogs that they are what's called clutch um, parasitism. So a male actually hop onto an egg mass after it's been fertilized and try and lay some sperm down against a few extras, which may be happening here. Whether that's related to sex person or not, I couldn't tell you at this point. What, what's the function of the Y chromosome if uh, an XX female can reverse successfully into a male and procreate? That's a great question. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> um, we know that you can actually evolve different sex chromosomes pretty fast, so it's not hard for a, an autosome, for instance, to accrue uh, genes that put you towards being one sex or another. Um, the frequency of sex reversal is still low enough in any given population to not actually swamp out in <coughs> populations at least the, the role of an X or Y chromosome on average. That makes sense. Have you thought about looking at um, sex like how activity of enzymes involved in sex steroidogenesis would be affected by environmental temperature and therefore body temperature? Like things like aromatase that would convert testosterone to estrogens? Mm -hmm. Totally. I would love to do all that sort of stuff. I actually saved a whole bunch of tissues from experiments in the field and already later for those kind of experiments. I just have so much time. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? So you talked about microgeographic variation really in the, in the yeah. temperature. What do you know about geographic variation in sex ratios? Oh, sex ratios. Uh, oh, nothing. Um, so in general, sex ratios and metamorphosis are pretty poorly understood in amphibians. No one's actually going out there grabbing metamorphs and opening them up. So what's with you people? <laughs> we got to get museums and no one's using them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's something we kind of need a little more. This species is kind of fun because we actually show um, microgeographic uh, adaptation to thermal regimes, so whether uh, altitudinally or uh, latitudinally. So yeah, there could be a very small uh, variation in, in that that's controlling temperature regimes too. It has a pretty large geographic right. range. Exactly. Oh yeah, these things go pretty far into Canada, pretty far down south. Mm -hmm. For, every, so, for context, um, I had a D-dig that allowed me to test how well these sex-linked markers work across the species range. And outside of New England, they don't really work anymore. They don't like predict sex. So whatever, wherever these markers are on test chromosomes, they're no longer sex <coughs> past New England, which isn't surprising given that Japan story I told you earlier. Um, but my guess is there are all sorts of weird sexual deems to this species as you go across its large range. Thanks. Very cool. Thank you very much.